reflecting on the Paticca Samupada and recognize that this is this is a psychological teaching about the mind. Sometimes it, we get confused by trying to apply Buddhist teachings to uh, say something like a creation myth or a genesis. That uh, and I repeat again that the world is a is a psychological world, and therefore that this this uh, arising from ignorance, then the the uh, that whole process takes place uh, from vijnana, nama rupa, salayatana, pasa, vedana. All that arises. The the nama rupa, everything. When, when there's ignorance, then everything is, is uh, it comes into being, into some, into something rather, some form, some mental formation. That we regard as the world, that's what the world is. And so that this is a way of, of looking at that, which we do, what we create out of this ignorance. And by doing that, then we can actually stop the process by not being ignorant. We can um, <coughs> not create these, these uh, worlds in which we suffer. <coughs> now that always applies to the moment. It's not, uh, not something that is for the next life. It's always in this moment. The, the word we use for the, the way things are, the, the suchness, datta-da in Pali, datta, tatta, datta-da, these words in the Pali mean the, the suchness of being. When you're, when, you're no, when you're not creating an illusory world, then things are as they are. And consciousness still arises, and nama rupa, salayatana, pasavajana, but no longer is there the dhanha, ubadana, pawa, chati, jaramarana, soka, parite, up, and so forth. The other is just the remaining karma of that, that this being will experience till the death of the body. Now the emptiness, when we talk about the suchness or the emptiness, the, the shunyata, anatta, these words imply that not a permanent soul or being, not a, an, an emptiness. When the Buddha was asked where he abided, he said, in the shunyata vihara, in the abiding in, it isn't the, like uh, uh, vihara as we know it, he said, it's an abiding in, in non-attachment. Mm. And you can realize that emptiness yourself. It's not just uh, something the Buddha can do. It's something each one of us can do and realize that. And when, uh, when we're not creating ourselves, when we're not arising as a personality and as somebody, then we, we don't suffer because there's nobody to suffer. Things are as they are. This formation here is a sensitive formation, so it's, it feels it's like this. When we reflect, this is the way it is. This human form is like this, so it's going to feel. You sit here for an hour, you, and whatever you're feeling is just the way it is. You feel cold, or you feel hot, you feel uh, uh, pain in your legs, or you feel uh, wonderful, you feel uh, inspired, you feel happy, or you feel uh, whatever, the, whatever feelings is just the way it is. Because of this, this, this uh, birth in this form, then 
this is this is the way this is the way it has to be why do we have to have pain why do we have to have disease and sickness and get old why and from the personal level we 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 this is the why isn't it why me why do i have to suffer why why do things bad things have to happen to me But as Dhamma, then it, it is as it is. Sickness, disease, uh, pain, all these things are part of the, are the result of birth in a, in a form that is vulnerable to those kind of experiences. Always has been since, the, since Adam and Eve up to the present time. Contemplate during the day and night. Just, just what it just. This is the way it is. It's like this. Being feeling is like this, so that you're you're with the, the actual body. You're you're really observing just what what it is to have a human body, where maybe you've never observed that. You've you've reacted to it. You've identified with it. You might have uh, ignored it tend to suppress or ignore the body or, or pay a lot of attention to it as, a, as if it were uh, really what I am. One can indulge it and, and vainly try to, to make it uh, beautiful and attractive or one can just try not to notice it, suppress it. But to actually just reflect on what it is to have a body like this It feels like this. What does it feel like? And then you, and then you contemplate it. What does it feel like? It doesn't have to. I'm not asking you to say it feels like anything, but to just notice what it is to be in a, in a body that weighs, that has weight, that's sensitive, that ha, that is uh, following the laws of nature, and therefore it operates according to these these uh, these laws it, it you have to feed it rest it bathe it its function excretory functions all this is are about the body it's the nature of the body it's like this so you're 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 bringing into into your awareness what it is to to have been born and what it is to be in a form like this it's a restriction isn't it a restraint being born in a, as a human being imagine what it'd be like to have a, a more ethereal body not just one of these clunky old earthbound bodies i used to like to imagine having a kind of ethereal body where you could kind of like like uh, Davidas and angels, where you can kind of fly around, not in airplanes, where you could fly up to the top of Mount Everest as a, as a kind of ethereal deva and not feel the cold and not have to wear all that mountain gear and <clears throat> risk your life and then climb the the rocks and the cliffs of, of those high mountain tops, just to be able to float up like a bubble in a beautiful form, lovely form, a lovely Devada on top of Mount Everest. But to get this thing up there, unless you drop me off in a parachute, but still. <laughs> But still, it's, it would be very cold up there and very unpleasant. The ethereal body, when, when you look out at the universe at night, uh, some of the night now, there's these clear, starlit night. And you feel so kind of limited and restricted as a, in a human body, don't you? What, like a little termite, a little bug, 
what can you, you know, you see, the, the, see a wonderful, marvelous universe out there, but n look where we're stuck. And we can kind of perceive it, and we can look at it and wonder about it, but it's, it's um, our ability to, to go to it, go toward it. We have to just, we just have to learn to accept the restriction and restraint of this form of being a, a human being. This is what it is to be human. To, and to surrender, to give up to that restraint the restriction, the limitation of our physical condition. Is one of the lessons of life, isn't it? Not to identify with it, not to think this is what I am, but this is this is the the form and the in the 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 restraint that we have to abide in for a lifetime. And if you don't get enlightened in this one, you probably have to come back again in another one. How many times have we been doing this? I don't know. I've often felt like one of these old souls. My mother said when I was born, I looked like an old kind of homunculus. She said I was really weasened, kind of old wrinkled thing wasn't kind of lovely, shining baby. <laughs> and, uh, and I often felt like that most of my life, in fact. Like some, somebody that, that is, even, when, even uh, when young, felt kind of old. Because this life on earth as a human being to me doesn't has never been a very attractive proposition. It never has has been uh, something that I found uh, uh, that I could really enjoy. Even though I've had nice moments, pleasant moments, don't misunderstand me, but something else, something. <clears throat> realizes that there has to be more to it than just than just the lollipops and ice cream cones of the human existence. Now our society gets very carried away with with trying to make everything right in the society itself. Is that this is a time where where there's so much concern and to try to get everything right, which is fine. Not complaining about that. But also, we, without any kind of spiritual goal in life, if we're just kind of material, materialistic utopians, uh, we're going to be very disappointed. And that's what we've been trying to do uh, here in the West, haven't we? Trying to build these societies uh, b based on ideals and uh, fairness and justice and all that. And, and uh, as much as we try to arrange it, and even at its best, it's never truly satisfying to us. It's not what we really want or where we really belong. Now the way of getting in touch, in tune, with deathlessness, with ultimate reality, is through the mindfulness, through pure awareness. Now contemplate that. How could it be any other way? How could you ever get in tune or in touch with the immortal through a condition? How could you, any state of mind, any conditioned thing, any thought, any symbol, any any form of consciousness, how could that possibly ever, uh, how could you ever really be in tune, in alignment with the ultimate reality? Because conditions are, 
arising and ceasing. They're impermanent, aren't they? Every single one of them. You can create kind of illusory realms, false realms, uh, that you can uh, uh, believe in. So you, people do that, whether you can, you can develop powers of concentration where you can uh, kind of develop uh, a realm of, of great light and beauty. But it also is, is uh, something that is conditioned by the mind. Its very existence depends on your, on your creating it. Where mindfulness allows us to to be as, with the as-is of being in whatever way it happens to be now, healthy, sickly, young or old, good fortune or bad fortune, praise, people loving you and praising people, hating you and criticizing you, whatever the, the turn of events might be, or your karma, whether you have... Uh, good fortune or bad fortune, and mindfulness is, is, always, is always what we can abide in, what we can be with. Because there's no attachment there. There's no... There, you're, you're, you're withdrawing your, your clutching paws and your claws. And you're, you're, you're allowing... You're, 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 you're opening the mind to the totality, the whole, rather than just distracting yourself by grasping this, grasping that. What other possible way is there, this logically speaking? Why did the Buddha, em- Buddha emphasize this, didn't he? The, the way out of suffering is through mindfulness. Appamado amatapadang. Heedfulness, apamado, is the way to the immortal. Mindfulness is the way to the amata, padang. So, it's just in this, this practice of mindfulness, this, this, because then, then your faculties for contemplation, reflection, are possible. And when you're truly mindful, some uh, you experience a, a sense of peace. When you're when you're no longer trying to become mindful or trying to get rid of something or trying to become something, you then you'll find true contentment, a sense of well-being and contentment, even with pain or cold or unpleasant physical sensations you might be having. Now, when we're reborn again as somebody, then we're, we're going out to this, we're thinking, of, uh, we're caught up in the habits, the tendencies of our life, our loves and hates and opinions and views and prejudices and biases and fears and doubts and worries, the whole lot take over. So an avicca bhajaya sankara, that whole thing arises, and we go and we can just look for the thing. We spend the day to trying to just reach out to the to the to the objects in the world, don't we? Either the sensory objects or thoughts, opinions, views, feelings we grasp, ideas. A whole day can be spent in just 
going from this thing to that thing. Things, isn't it? The mind going toward things, getting stuck onto things, is what happens. And so there's this, that's consciousness, is where your mind gets stuck onto things. <clears throat> so you, you, uh, the aramana, or the objects that of, of the sense organs, they're the things you get stuck on. From this avicca bhajaya sankara, and you, you can just spend your life just distracting, getting stuck on this, and then you can't, and then you go to the next one, you get stuck on the next one. And if you don't have anything to stick to, you feel very uncomfortable, don't you? And so either you want to fall asleep and crash out and become unconscious, or you find something else, you always find something to stick to. And that's the desire, isn't it? Desire to, to have something, to be, become something. That's to, to watch yourself... Uh, just being restless and looking at thumbing through books and and looking for something to eat, having a cup of tea, looking around for something to do, somebody to talk to, uh, something to eat, something to have a cigarette, kill time, we call it, putting in time. You're looking for something to stick to. To, to become that. Because if there's nothing to stick on to, nothing to become, then what is there? That's frightening, isn't it? There's a doubt, uncertainty, unsurety. We don't like being unsure, uncertain. We want to know. Tell me what I should do with my life, Ajahn Sumato. <laughs> be nice wouldn't it to have have God come and say you should do this and you should do that have some 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 really powerful being somebody up there that knows all the answers and tell you what to do would you like that is that what you want here and Amravati, is that what you're looking for? For God to come and tell you what you should do? Somebody to tell you who you are, where you're going, how you should practice, provide everything, all the information? Because that's one, one uh, stage in human development is where we want uh, somebody else to be responsible for us, because we don't feel we can be responsible for ourselves. And in one age, that's true. And we're children, we can't be responsible for ourselves. We have to depend on our parents, hopefully, that they'll be responsible, because we can't be. But some people never grow up spiritually. They're still looking for mother and father. somebody to tell them who they are, what they should do, everything's all right. You're loved, we love you dear, and you're all right, and everything's going to be all right. <laughs> but the, the uh, way of a samana, this, this is the path of a samana, uh, one who's an anagarika, one who's gone forth, a samana, one who's gone forth from the home to the homeless. You mean you're going out of that, of that kind of a situation where mother and father protect you and, where, and, and uh, say everything's all right. You're going forth and it's, it's into the unknown, isn't it? The idea of going forth, the anagarika, the one who's gone forth, into the unknown. You don't know where you're going. Because you're not, you're not, it's not any place, is it? 
but you've, you've left, you've gone forth, gone from the home into homelessness. So that means you have to look at the unknown. You have to look at the black and the dark and the uncertain and the, and the, the unstable. And, and you, at sometimes you really want to run back home, don't you? They, Mommy, Daddy, tell me everything's all right. <laughs> because uh, that's, uh, that's what we remember, the sense of security, of having a home where we have somebody to tell us, somebody to look after us, somebody to, to love us. where the Samana goes forth to, into the unknown. Now the Samana is, is an interesting word. Because it, it means someone who's, who's following the way of self-reliance. It's a, it's a religious path of self-reliance say in contrast to devotional religion, which is path of grace. And the devotional religion de is a path of devotion and depending on the grace of, of God. And the uh, summoner, summoner form of religion is emphasizing the way of self-reliance. So the, the grace type of religion is, is very attractive to have, to feel that there's somebody out there who's going to send me grace. Because one still is very much bound to a view of being a, some, a person who needs help from something else, from some, some external force. And that's the, that's the view, say, of a bhakti or uh, Christianity is very much in that, in that mode. But the samana form of religion is emphasizing, uh, it, it goes to, right to the, to the um, it's a very direct path where you're no longer uh, even cherishing those divisive and separative symbols and formations. The Gnostic religion, isn't it? Gnostic religion no longer is, 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 is following that particular pattern because it goes right to the very, right to the ultimate, the realization of ultimate reality which is something you have to realize for yourself. But the self is not the self of, of an ego or a, an attachment to the five khandhas or the, or the personality that we have. It's a, you relinquish all that. You let go of, of the personality, the ego, the, the five khandhas the letting go into the unknown, into the black hole, they are jumping off the abyss, the, the cliff into the abyss. This the into it's a without without the uh, asking for even grace or anything to prop you up taking that risk. Well, you're not, the, you know, well, I believe that if I jump off this cliff, God will protect me. Even that thought has to, is, is relinquished. It leaves, leaves you with no thing whatsoever. There's no thing, things to get stuck on to. There's no thing to get stuck onto, no rebirth, in other words, in this particular path of a samana.
in this path, though, the, the way of, uh, of, of being content. It's a path of contentment, this, this way of life. This is the way to be truly content. How many of you really feel contentment with your life here? Or really content? Because the only reason why you aren't is because you're still trying to become something. Or trying to change something, get rid of something. Because what is this life here at Amravati? Alms mendicancy, just the the, uh, the the food is is offered to us every day, isn't it? Food's never been a problem here. Place to to live in, robes to wear, medicine for illness, uh, good company. Uh, Pleasant and benevolent society. And so you're the contentment of, of, of living a moral life, of being able to, to encourage to be a moral being, to keep sila, to be encouraged to practice the Dhamma all the time, to encourage to in every way toward the spiritual realization. And yet, how many of you really find contentment in this life? It's because of desire, isn't it? You want something else. You still, you still create yourself. You still get stuck on the things. And you still want to become something or want to go somewhere else or want to do something else. And so the, the way of contentment is to let go of that desire. And as we see in this Paticca Samupada, uh, you begin to see what we're doing. Not just, we're not being high-minded by saying you shouldn't have any desires here. I'm not asking you to do something impossible. But through the complete understanding of the nature of desire, then you, you're not going to grasp it. You're not going to grasp the fire once you know that it burns you. First you have to realize how it, much it hurts. Isn't it? You have to realize that grasping fire hurts. Grasping desire hurts. Desire is like a wild fire. It's it's not like like a a, a pocket warmer, <laughs> nicely contained heat. Desire burns, and yet you you burn yourself all the time, and you still and you but you probably blame other people for it, or blame something or other, rather than than really look at what you're doing. It's interesting to just why fire is such a symbol, a religious symbol in all religions, isn't it? Fire is 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 uh, the, the burnt sacrifice, burnt offerings of primitive religions. And yet we know that if we grasp fire with our hands, it's going to hurt. So we don't grasp fire with our hands, do we? We know better. But we can grasp fire with our minds and get burnt all the time by doing it. Maybe it's depression, despair, disillusionment. Soka parite vatuka tomanasu payasa is the is the pain of grasping fire with your mind. The result is you end up with with that, soka pariteva tukatomanasa upayasa. That's why life gets so miserable for us. 
for human, humanity because of it's always burning us. We're always hurting ourselves in the fire. And we keep trying to f find an, on something else to grasp, some other fire to get stuck on to. Because the fire that's burning you hurts. So you look, you see another one, and you think, oh, I like that one. You run over there. Stick on to that one and get burned. Now if you don't now if you don't touch fire, you can you can you can warm yourself with it on a cold day, isn't it? Fire is a very nice thing. If it's contained and if you don't grasp it, and if it's if it's uh, if the uh, fire is a, is a lovely lovely thing we have, we can use it to to heat water to make a cup of tea. We can use it to keep warm. We can use fire in so many ways that is skillful and and beautiful. So the way of the Samana is the way of knowing what the fire is, the way things are, and to no, no longer just be caught in this blind grasping, struggling, resisting, uh, running about out of avicca bhajaya sankara. So in each moment, there's a moment of contentment. Here we are. This is the way it is. Roof over our head. Nice warm room. Robes. Nice robes. And uh, very nice food you're providing us with. <laughs> it's only TLC we get from the Anagarikas and Anagarikas and the lay people. All these little trays that go off to the sick bhikkhus. Endless supply of little trays and flasks. It's like having a mother. <laughs> and the uh, ability to be, live a moral life and the encouragement and support for it. The, the way people are willing to support this community to help us, to, to allow us to contemplate and practice the Dhamma. So there's a, this contentment of just being at ease without grasping, without having to stick on to things, without having to run about, having to get something or get rid of something. Contemplate that, that, that terrible restlessness and, and compulsiveness of the human mind that comes out of ignorance. All that whole those latent tendencies, and always having to uh, feeling this compulsion to to do something, to get something, get rid of something. So you can spend an afternoon in this room just feeling very content. This afternoon I sat here for three hours, feeling very, very content. It's a lovely way to spend an afternoon, being content, isn't it? At least I think so, considering how I used to spend afternoons. <laughs> being content with just being sitting here with the robes and the way things are. not feeling uh, necessary to, to try to, to, to make it any other way. Everything was, was, was very, was all right. There was no kind of emergencies, life-threatening situations this afternoon. It was all very calm, very uh, peaceful, and perfectly suitable towards being completely content and at ease. So the holy life 
if if lived and seen and 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 if you stop resisting it and and uh, grasping it, then you'll find true contentment in the holy life. But to be content, you have to let life be what it is, yeah, and understand it, and not, not uh, like even with with physical pain or uh, ailments or whatever. To one can be content even with with those, because we're not we're not saying I want a life without pain. I want to live in a place where. Nothing will upset me, where nothing will displease me, where everything will be just what I want. I don't, we don't ask that. We don't ask that we live in a place, that this place here be just what we want for me, that it just fit every, every ideal I have of what I think a proper monastery should be. Because if that's the case, then I then I end up becoming critical. And one's always critical faculties will start going off by thinking uh, about how it would be better if, and if it would be better if they did that, and if they didn't do this, and if this were different, and that were another way. And, and there's no contentment in that state of mind, is there? No way you can find any real peace or contentment by endlessly kind of criticizing or wanting things to be something that they are not. So the samana, we, we're not asking for the best, but we, we have a, a roof over the head for one night, a robe to wear, a meal once a day, medicine for illness. The Dhamma is being not the Vinaya is respected. So there's 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 no reason to be discontented. What is necessary is 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 uh, here. So there's no the discontentment then you can see is your attachment, your your ignorance the avicca bhajaya sankara and then with this reflection on Patija Samupadra you can actually uh, investigate that I'm not saying you should be content here I'm saying there's no reason why you shouldn't be content here <laughs> But whether you're content here or not, that's something you have to discover uh, and see what's happening. Uh, if in, in the for the standard of the samana and the life, the holy life, then there's nothing lacking, nothing missing. So there's no reason why you shouldn't be content here. But I can't say you should be content here. All I can say is that uh, I can kind of give you suggestions and ways of investigating discontentment, suffering, and the, the whole realm of that you create in your mind from the avicca, bhajaya sankara, sankara bhajaya vinyanam, vinyana bhajaya namarupang, namarupa bhajaya salayatanam, Salayatana Bhajaya Paso, Pasa Bhajaya Vedana, Vedana Bhajaya Danha, Danha Bhajaya Upadha Nang, Upadhana Bhajaya Pavo, Pava Bhajaya Jati, Jati Bhajaya Jaramaranang Sukha Parite Vatukatomanasa Upaya Sampawanti Eva Medasa Kemalasa Tuka Kantasa Samutayo Hote. 
not teaching, isn't it? Then the way is to 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 let go of that desire. Uh, we say so. Viraka, viraka is is um, desirelessness. Viraka, nirodo, ankara nirodo, ankara down to the end of that one. So as as we let go of desire, and then th- we see that letting go, we we actually realize the the letting go. Then it then it then when there's uh, mindfulness is developed further, then there's non-attachment. There's non-attachment to the conscious experiences that we that we have, or to the feelings, the vedana of of that is the result of birth. There's non-attachment, non-grasping, non-identification with it. So that whole thing ceases. And what remains is the suchness, the way things are. And our life as a as a samana then has been perfected. This is the realization of an arahant. And this is a an arahant is a term used to to describe what is possible for human perfection. What it means, what that implies. That and don't don't if you think that you're going to become an arahant, you've got it wrong. You don't become an arahant because there's nobody to become anything. You let go of the idea of becoming anyone. Then you're an arahant. <laughs> but it's not you, is it? It's not a person. It's a realization. It's a freedom, the ultimate freedom. It's true contentment. It's peace, peacefulness. Non-delusion, viraka, non-desire, desirelessness. The cessation, niroda, the cessation of delusion. So contemplate this, and and uh, this. Uh, just keep, keep, uh, keep examining, investigating things in this, according to this teaching. So you, you really know what desire is. You really know what grasping of desire, the result of grasping desire. You know what it is. You're not just repeating Paticca Samuppada like a parrot. You are actually Realizing, investigating, insight, having insight into this. So you just don't quote Paticca Samuppada as if it, as, uh, because so you can kind of show off your, your, uh, your, your knowledge of the suttas. But you're actually applying it to, to daily life here in Amravati, the way things are here, the way you happen to be feeling. 